Oh, hi. I didn't see you there. No, please. Huddle around my fire. Like, I get it. It's brutal out there. There's snow everywhere. Millions are just left stranded to the elements. But you know, that's just Texas in the winter. The day after tomorrow, also known as Global Warming, the blockbuster, is a disaster movie from director Roland Emmerich, a man we all know and love who has never made anything terrible, ever. I have a strange obsession with Emmerich movies. Like, one of my biggest videos was about 2012, and the other one was about White House Down. I was even gonna talk about his most recent masterpiece, the Korean romance drama, Moonfall. <laughs> But then I didn't really have the best winter, because God help me if this state can handle the thermometer going below 30 degrees. That's what I like about Texas. The Day After Tomorrow is one of my favorite disaster movies, and it's probably because it's the only one that actually scared me as a kid. Most things in movies don't scare me, but from the age of 8 to 10, I was petrified of tornadoes. Really just storms in general. And I think this movie is the reason why. Like, it either started that fear or it fed into it. I've never figured that out. But I think when you're afraid of something, you're also almost fascinated by it too. At least I was. Like, tornadoes scared me to death, but I was obsessed with the weather. I wanted to learn everything about it. And that fascination made me even more enamored with this movie. Like, this wasn't just aliens destroying a city or an asteroid. This was the climate itself. Day After Tomorrow is a movie that isn't perfect, but it's always been close to my heart. And I want to reiterate the it isn't perfect part. Like, that's, that's very important. Global warming. It's an issue. One that people talk about. And they were starting to talk about it in the early 2000s. I assume. The furthest extent of my environmental consciousness back then was just cleaning up goop in Super Mario Sunshine. Did you know that this movie came out two years before Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth? Which means that for a lot of Americans, their first major exposure to climate change wasn't old gal pal Al. I have ridden the mighty moonworm. It was, well, this. The theater just came and erased the Hollywood sign. The Hollywood sign is gone. It's now, when it comes to this movie, we could probably just chalk up what happens here to being Hollywood entertainment. It's not like it's trying to be scientifically realistic. This movie isn't suggesting that it's possible that gigantic storms could create a new ice age in under a week. I mean, it's not like anyone was out there suggesting that that was going to be a possibility. The Coming Global Superstorm is a 1999 novel by paranormal broadcaster Art Bell and horror novelist Whitley Stryber. In it, they suggest that global warming may lead to the collapse of the Gulf Stream, and it would create a series of storms which would bring on a new ice age. Like that whole woolly mammoth thing, the thing about it getting frozen in the ice, that was directly from the book. In fact, most of the things that go down in this movie are based on the book. So what is this book? It's made by two fiction authors, so is this just a hypothetical? Is this a work of creative fiction? You stupid monkey! <laughs> uh, nope. The official Amazon store page. The climatological nightmare portrayed in the motion picture The Day After Tomorrow isn't just a fantasy scenario. Global warming is about to cause the North Atlantic current to drop to a more southerly route sending arctic air barreling into overheated temperate zones sudden dramatic changes in climate all over the world the most severe blizzards in history 100 mile per hour winds shocking death rates if you watched my 2012 video then you might be familiar that roland based that movie off of another crackpot novel fingerprints of the gods is roland emmerich just finding these novels about insane theories and using them as inspiration for his multi-million dollar disaster movies? Yes. Yes, he is. I figured out your scheme, Roland. The gig is up. Hey, yo, what the fuck? God, I want to talk about Moonfall so bad. Now, I don't think he's doing this because he actually believes it or is trying to red pill the general audience. He probably just finds this stuff entertaining as hell, which who can blame him? I want to rename this the Tinfoil Hat Cinematic Universe. Now this movie was kind of hated on by nerds for being scientifically inaccurate, but to me, I don't care. It's pretty clear that the main purpose is to just have crazy weather destruction. 
I think an actually realistic movie about the effects of climate change wouldn't be the most visually interesting. Like, have a disaster movie where it's just combing through years of climate data, or just have people screaming on a sunny day because it's week four with no rain. But instead, you know, we're stuck to watch this type of disaster movie. The boring one with tornadoes and floods, if you're into that sort of stuff. You can divide the day after tomorrow into two parts. The first half has this tense and foreboding atmosphere. The storm is getting bigger, and it all culminates in this giant flood. The second half is sitting in a library. People huddled around being cold for an hour. I always forget about the second part every time I rewatch this movie. I only recall the neat interesting stuff, the destruction, and then after that tidal wave, it's just an hour of this. Yeah, this movie has a pacing problem. Now I think about it, a lot of Emmerich movies have a pacing problem. Like, the most exciting part of them, the thing that gets you into the theater, is always the initial 40 minutes, and then the rest of the movie is just people sitting around until things kinda just end. Now there's nothing wrong with slowing a movie down and focusing on the characters, but this is an Emmerich film. These people only exist to react to CGI effects. Nobody ever says they like this movie because this guy is such a stellar character. Or they like the banter of this bickering, pretentious couple. Please, Nietzsche was a chauvinist pig who was in love with his sister. The exceptions to this rule are Independence Day and Moonfall. But only because Moonfall just goes right off the rails at the end. Our journey begins as all serious films do with Bank Gothic. Now, as generic as this font is today, being used by every serious action movie, the theme has no right to be this good. <coughs> and it certainly carries the weight for a lot of the major emotional points. It's so strange that the composer Harold Closer never made something comparable to this again. He just kept making generic soundtracks for Emmerich, and who could forget the hit film Rudy, the Rudy Giuliani story. The main protagonist of our tale is Dennis Quaid, or as I call him, Jack. <laughs> Jack is a paleoclimatologist, also known as the one guy who is specifically qualified for this exact situation. I want to make a film where gigantic alien muffins are conquering the planet, and it's up to our protagonist with a master's in baking science to save the day. Unlike everyone else, Dennis Quaid knows what an ice age is. He saw the entire series. They made way too many sequels. He even escaped the jaws of a glacier. He's just that good. Jack travels to the other side of the planet, only to be ridiculed and guffawed at by a bunch of old politicians. This is so we can have our payoff at the end of the movie, where our protagonist is reluctantly proven right. We, we didn't listen! A lot of inaccurate things are just reality in this world. Like how the Turks wear fezes for some reason. It's kind of like showing a modern-day German and they're wearing a pickle hob. This isn't World War I. No. It's 2004. Aggressively 2004. Our main antagonist, outside of the weather, I guess, is the vice president. Oh my god. It's Kamala Harris. Nah, I'm just kidding. You know who it is. So this is kind of related. Turns out the guy that Cheney shot directly in the face on that hunting trip like 15 years ago just recently died. Of natural causes. It's not like he was just suffering for almost two decades. I just found it hilarious how every media site reported his death. Like, imagine being a lawyer, a real estate developer, and playing a key part in Texas politics your whole life. And you're just forever remembered as the guy that Cheney shot. That's a fate worse than death right there. Anyway, Liquid Cheney is a big old grump and more concerned about the economy than the environment. Our economy is every bit as fragile as the environment. Little does he know that things are happening in the Atlantic. Beeps are beeping and lights are flashing. Roland loves to use this in his movies. Something beeps on the computer that shouldn't have, and some expert goes up to the screen and is like, My God. In fact, that's Jack's specialty. But not only does he have to balance the VP and beeping computers, he has to balance his home life, as his neglected son Jake Gyllenhaal is going off to New York City to compete in a quiz bowl. Can you think there's a girl in love? 
And it's all for a chance to get with this one girl who's really into the stuff. Is this how honor students hook up? I wouldn't know. I was a solid C plus student. Real prime YouTuber material. Sam is one of those nerds that thinks he's better than all the other nerds. And he probably is. But for the first half of the movie, he really doesn't seem like he wants to be there. It's a tried and true dynamic. The trio of the white guy, black nerd, and girl. It held up the world of 2000s media. This scene with the turbulence has stuck with me and will always replay in my head whenever I'm in a plane. She just smiles it off. If I was on that plane after that, I'd be running up and down the halls like Japan gets bonked by falling frozen water. Los Angeles gets wiped off the map by twisters. It's the worst storm of the century, and LA still doesn't get rain. For some reason, I've always remembered the St. Louis Arch being involved in this movie. Like, it must have been a deleted scene or something. I tried looking it up, and I couldn't find it anywhere. I thought I was in a Mandela Effect situation. But after asking the internet, somebody immediately knew what I was talking about. Apparently, I was thinking about the cheap knockoff film of Day After Tomorrow, Category 6, Day of Destruction. Maybe I should have talked about that movie. Anyway, the royal family tries to fly Britain before things get worse, but it's too late and their choppers get obliterated by Mr. Freeze. Mr. Freeze in recent years had become an avid supporter of Irish independence. All right, everyone. Chill. So what's happening here is that the storm is sucking air from the upper atmosphere all the way down to Earth so fast that it doesn't have time to warm. Is that scientifically accurate? No. Is it cool as hell? Yes. Wait, shit, that wasn't meant to be a pun. In the back of my mind, I knew it wasn't really possible to happen, but there were times while standing outside, I would just look at the flagpole, just waiting for that fucker to freeze. Because this movie has extreme pacing issues, we've reached the most interesting part of the movie, the flood. I always thought this was supposed to be a tsunami or something, which doesn't make much sense since there's no earthquake. Turns out that it's a really big storm surge. A storm surge that never goes away and becomes a glacier. Science rules. Water effects still look great. It's all very wet and miserable, like the real New York. Honestly, the only thing that really takes away from it are the people who just can't help but look back every chance they get. What was I running from again? Oh yeah. The rest of the film is Jack and friends walking through a snowstorm, while Sam and friends wait to be picked up at the public library. The most they do is just go onto a boat to try to get some medicine for the nerdy girl. She was complaining about a cut on her leg a few days ago. I didn't think anything of it. What took you so long, idiot? After an hour of this, Jack reaches his son. He made it to New York. He says there are survivors. Oh. Our film ends with a monologue from Liquid Cheney, now President of the United States after Liquid Bush died in the blizzard. So we're told. The American government had to flee to Mexico, and this humbling experience made Cheney realize how foolish he had been. He gives a speech that admits his entire ideology was wrong. We operated under the belief that we could continue consuming our planet's natural resources without consequence. We were wrong. In a movie of mega-twisters, storms that span the globe, and a new ice age starting in three business days, the most unrealistic part of this movie is a politician admitting their mistakes. 